Good to go. Today we are going to be reading this Transfiguration Sunday from Matthew 17. And we are going to be reading verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. And Peter explained, Lord, it is wonderful for, wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified, and they fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. And as they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I already sent the young folks out already, so. How was your week? Great. You saw three robins today. <laughs> three, three robins today? See, they were confused yesterday too. <laughs> I was confused. I was like ready to go run around in shorts and. Grady had a couple of friends come over and they all took off and went outside like it was spring already, right? Hopefully, I mean, maybe not. Maybe we got away with a mild winter and we're ready to coast into spring, but something in my gut tells me there's more cold coming. I don't know what that is. Probably because nature, right? Things need to freeze a little bit yet. They haven't done that, so hold on. So, whether it was warm, whether it was cold, whether it was busy, whether all the things you had going on in life right, were overwhelming, I pray that somewhere, somehow, you had uh, time to be rooted, right? You, you had some prayer time, you had some scripture time, you and God just getting together, communicating. I also pray that you had time to, to push yourself and stretch yourself in some way, that you were involved in something that was helping you to grow. And then I hope some way, somehow, you didn't hold all that information, all that inside, but that you shared it. We're able to spread, keeping with our theme this year, rooted, growing, and spreading, right? So we started February three weeks ago. I know, it sounds weird, right? I told you, it's going to come fast. It'll be here before we know it. Wednesday is already Ash Wednesday, which means we're going to start in the Lent, right? Today's Transfiguration Sunday. We see Jesus transformed, right? All that stuff. It's already here. Like the thing that we were just talking about, it's already here. It's already happening and it's already moving. So we started, you know, in February, we started with the Beatitudes. We learned that Jesus is showing us that through our grief and through our pain, through our struggle and turmoil, that there's blessings that come from that. And we find out that, that Jesus is not just a, um, a savior, but he's also the fulfiller of the law, right? He makes it so our relationship with God is restored, something we can't do on our own, and that he brings all of those laws with him, and that in doing what he says, and in completing that process, we can fulfill the law through him, not necessarily through ourselves. And then last week, we talked about uh, workers, right? God's calling us to be those workers. He's calling us to be that grace and that love into the world so that people can see it. We are to be the caretakers of his field, which is us, right? And so today, that brings us to this Transfiguration Sunday. And I know you're going to have to bear with me a little bit because I'm, I'm going to take you a little bit differently than normal, normal Transfiguration Sunday. Yes, it's kind of going to fit with what Darcy just said. <laughs> you'll, you'll get that out here in a minute. <laughs> So it's not a coincidence that Jesus chooses the three men that he chooses to go up on the mountain. 
And this is the, the Pastor Mike interpretation version. Uh, you're not going to find this in your, your devotional Bible or study Bible. This is just my <clears throat> personal vision of it. Is that, you know, when Jesus has been with the disciples for a while now, when you get to this point in the story, he's talked about his resurrection, he's talked about his death, he's talked about how it's going to be necessary for him to sacrifice himself so that everyone might have eternal life, right? He's said this over and over. I can imagine that in their, in their inner circle, right, in the, in the conversations that we don't have in Scripture, it was probably even more prevalent there, too. And so Jesus is like, okay, they're not going to get it. And so I want to take these three guys. These three guys are going to be absolutely crucial to the spreading of the gospel. They're going to be absolutely crucial to the growth of the church. I already told Peter he's going to be the rock on which the church is built. John, of course, John is always going to be there. John's like his steadfast, his rock, right? He stays with him, even in his sides of the crucifixion, all the way to his burial. John is that guy who is always there. And James, James is ever moving, right? He's always wanting to be more and more part like his brother, John. And so Jesus takes these very three important people with him up on the mountain. And for the purpose, so that they will see him in a different way. So he takes them up to the mountain, right? And immediately, Jesus becomes something else. Jesus is transfigured. Now, we can use a different word, because we don't walk around going tra using the word transfigured all the time, do we? I mean, a lot of times, I like the word transformation, or transformed better. Uh, it, it's something that we'd say a little bit more frequently than transfigured. But transformed, meaning that he became something that he was not previously. In other words, they're used to just seeing a guy like you and I see each other right now, and they go up to this mountain and he becomes this bright, shining light, right? White as white can be, bright. You know, probably hard to see. I'm imagining it's kind of one of these moments where they're like, Dang, I can't see you. And then Moses and Elijah appeared. And I know in Matthew, it's the same in Mark. These two men are named, and it's kind of be intentional, or they wouldn't say who they were. <laughs> Moses and Elijah are very important to this transformation story. If you remember, Moses and Elijah in, in Old Testament scripture are the only ones who did not die. Moses wandered off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. He doesn't have a burial cloth. There's nobody that ever saw him die. Elijah, well, Elijah, there was a chariot of fire that came down from heaven. He hopped on board and away he went. Two men who did not die or the death suddenly appear with Jesus. I find it ironic that Jesus is trying to get the story across. Number one, you're going to have to be transformed so you don't look like the world. And number two, if you want to hang out with the three of us, those who did not die, then you're going to have to do what, what God says. Right? In Peter's panic, right, he gets all excited. Now we know Peter through, I mean, through Scripture, read through the Gospels. You'll find out who Peter is, man. Peter is the overzealous, overexcited, over and over and uh, compensating person that he is. He's going to do everything to the to the one thousandth degree, right? And so here's Peter. He's getting all excited. He's like, "Oh, this is amazing! This is so cool, Jesus! I, I know this is important. So how about how about if I just start making three little monuments right here in this space to, to you and Elijah and Moses? We'll make it just this greatest thing." And then, this bright cloud comes in the voice of God. What does he say? This is my son, my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. Boy, I don't know about you, but I think they reacted accordingly and they probably relieved themselves and fell down on their faces. This was a moment of, oh no. 
what did I do? And Peter's, you know, over enthusiastic intention to build another monument or build another idol to this situation and to this time, God wanted to be very clear, you've got to listen to my son. He's going to tell you exactly what it is that you need to do, and you need to listen. And so they are stuck now in this prone position. They're on the ground, face down, and they are afraid for their lives. I mean, they're in the presence of what they perceive, and the only thing they can think of it is, is God. Jesus comes and taps them on the shoulder. What does he say? Come on. Get up, don't be afraid. Get up! Don't be afraid. Get up and don't be afraid. And when they get up and they look around, everything's gone, everything's back to normal. And Jesus is left with them. And he says, Now, we're going to go back down the hill. But I don't want you to say anything about what you saw here today until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. You know, why would you expect that, they, that he would say that? Because nobody's going to understand it. He brought those three in to try and get them an open window to what is going to happen, what it might look like, but knowing full well, nobody's really going to understand it until they see Jesus' tomb is empty and he's risen. Now share it, because they'll get it. It's one of the reasons we have this in Scripture today. Why we go back to it and we read it again? We can understand it. He's already risen. He's already there. The crucial part of this text is the transfiguration. The transformation that Jesus shows them has to happen. He shows them that even him, God, in human form, he has to look differently than the world. That's the idea and concept, right? We can go all throughout Scripture and we can find different pieces and different people. Trust me, if you're going to get into our little study, you're going to find this out. There are tons of people that have gone through transformation. They've allowed God to impact their life and he has changed their outcome. One of the ones that I think about the most is Daniel. Right? We think of, we hear the word Daniel, what's the first thing we might think of? Daniel and the lion's den, right? But what we forget is it should be Daniel and the extraordinary prayer life. That's what we should, that's the way the story should be told, right? Because Daniel was a prayer. I mean, he had an immaculate prayer life. He spent hours a day praying to his God. He was in an important position. He was a friend and advisor to the king, right? And some of those other guys got jealous of him and what he was doing. And so they said, we're going to set him up. We're going to go tell the king that he, people need to bow down to him, pray to him. And when they don't, I think they're going to be thrown into the lion's den. And watch. We'll watch and see, because either Daniel's going to cave and he's going to join us, or he's going to die in that life. And so it comes time. The law is decreed, and Daniel says, I don't know, man. You can't take the place of my God. I can't give up everything that I believe in. I can't set aside everything that I have hope in for this. And so Daniel fails to bow down. He fails to pray to somebody else, and he continues to pray to God. And the king finds out, and he says, listen, this is the law. And Daniel says, I don't care. You're not the boss of me. God is. And he says, fine. Off to the Daniel go. And Daniel says, cool, let's go. What happens? Nothing happens because Daniel is protected. He's, he's got God's favor. He knows what God is doing. Why? Because he's got this great prayer life. It wasn't just God saying, oh, Daniel, you look pretty cool. Let me protect you from those, from those lions. No! It was the intimate relationship that Daniel 
glad of God, through that prayer life, they changed Daniel. He was transfigured. He was transformed. He was not the Daniel of the world. He was the Daniel that was in relationship with God. That's what saved him from the lions. And just like Daniel, we are going to have lion's den moments in our life, right? We're going to have times when we feel like there's no way out. There's, this whole thing is messed up. I'm going to die here in this moment. And what we are afraid of is looking like, oh, we're weird, or we're going to go, oh, the world's going to make fun of me because I pray, and whatever, right? And in reality, what God is calling us to do is he's calling us to transformation. He's calling us not to look like the world. He's calling us to do that from the heart of a prayer life that looks like Daniel. He wants us to pray. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to keep looking and looking and looking and finding Him because He is always a breath away. He is always right here, and He will always be found. We always, you know, we use that phrase, if you found Jesus, what? Like He's lost. We're the ones that are lost. He's always right there. I could continue going through person after person after person within the Bible and we can see what that prayer life looks like and what transformation looks like. And then next, not this coming Wednesday, because this Wednesday is going to be Ash Wednesday service, but then the following Wednesday, we're going to start a Lenten study called Renew. We're going to work on renewing our transformation, our personal formation. So that way we can go, we're going to go through different people each week in scripture whose lives are impacted and make them look different through their life and their relationship with God. Old and New Testament. We're going to talk about the things that made them different. What was the moment in which everything changed for them? What we find is we find that it was the closer they got into their relationship with God, the more things changed. That's what God wants. In a society that currently tells us that God's not important, that, that God is, that is useless, and in a society that tells us, hey, let's stay busy, right? Just talking about that. We're always worried about what comes next, or even what was past. We're always worried about the next thing or the next thing. We're always caught up in, in, in finding our, you know, what our purpose is. What's our hope? And the thing that we all forget is we all forget that it becomes clear if we have a better prayer life and a better scripture time life together. That all becomes more and more clear the more it becomes. He's wanting a relationship with you, one that isn't part time, one that isn't just in, but he's wanting all of you, as much as you can give him. The more that you can give him, the more he's going to get back into it. Not to be a prosperity preacher, but I mean it's not saying I'm not saying he's going to give you a fat bank account just because you prayed all day. No, instead he's going to give you peace. He's going to give you comfort and ease in what you've got. Matter of fact, as that prayer life and that study life increases, you're probably going to find him calling you to give things up. Put things to the side that aren't important. God is so concerned with our transformation that that's where corporate change happens. I've seen a lot, I've read a lot, I've studied a lot, and all I can see and all that looks profitable to me from a, a scriptural basis is personal transformation. When we, when we have, so we could have, as a church, we could have the greatest programs and the greatest events and the greatest stuff, and it's going to look good when we write down numbers on a piece of paper, but what we're missing and why churches aren't growing anymore is because we're not standing up here having a service that looks like a church service, that smells like a church service, in which the Holy Spirit is here, in which we hear the word of God, in which we are moved to change. We aren't hungry anymore. We've been getting the milk. Remember last week? We've been getting the milk. 
And we're satisfied with it, and that's all we want. And then we leave, and we wonder why our life's a mess. He wants us to come here hungry. He wants us to eat steak and potatoes, and he wants us to have to use a fork and a knife, and he wants us to take our time, and he wants us to digest it, not just today, but he wants us to digest it all week long. And if we can focus on our own personal transformation, it is not only going to transform our church, it's going to transform our community, and it's going to transform our county, it's going to transform our state. See where I'm going with this? And it all starts with you. Individually is where that starts. Now my prayer for you is that through this Lenten season, you understand the importance of that, that moment. The importance of transformation. The importance of, and there are things that I need to stop doing in my life if I want them to get better, if I want them to look better, if I want to feel better. There's things that I've got to start doing differently. And as each one of us has that personal movement, that personal transformation, it's going to change everything else. At the end of the story, right, we just saw Jesus say, okay, we're coming down the mountain, and then don't tell anybody. So the set of man is raised from the dead. Don't say anything about what you saw. So they get to the bottom of the hill, and what happens? They run right into a very angry father, right? And he says, Jesus, you've got to help us. My son, he's got a demon. He, he's got his money. He goes into convulsions. He becomes rich. He gnashes his teeth. Your disciples tried to cast it out, but I couldn't. And what's Jesus say? This amazing moment just happened. He comes down, he comes down the bottom of the mountain, and I'm going to find this. Oh, you unbelieving generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Whoa. Like he's serious now. Jesus proceeds to then cast out this demon. And everybody is joyous and happy. And they go about their way. But as they're leaving, the disciples are talking to Jesus. And they're like, how did you do that? We've been casting out demons. And we've been doing the and We've been doing all this stuff. Why couldn't, why couldn't we do it? And in Mark 9, 29, when we go read Mark 9 to read this transfiguration version, Mark 9, 29, Jesus says, this kind can only come out by prayer. Some translations say this can only come out by prayer and fasting. Things that we've lost over the years. I've had some conversations with, with some of you uh, outside of normal services and normal church, but the world is starting to not look the way God had intended it to. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is we're seeing, and data proves this, that the younger the generation, probably like Greece, Elena, and younger, they are finding that they are paying attention to the generations directly in front of them. They don't like what they see. They don't like the turmoil. They don't like the, you can be whatever you want. Because when you get the opening to be whatever you want, there comes a whole new stress level. What if I'm not everything I want? What if I'm not what I'm supposed to be? What if I'm not what somebody else thinks I'm good enough for? What if I'm not good enough to be what I want to be? You see where that goes? Continues to build, it continues to build, it continues to build. One of the things that I said in our last confirmation class, I said, guys, there's one thing that you do with your life. Find something that you're passionate about, right? Something you're good at. Talent, the gift, hold on to that passion. Hold on to that because that's where God's going to use you and He's going to mold you and, and, and let you mold other people. We've been, we've been forgetting to tell that to kids. They can be whatever they want, they can do whatever they want. And now our younger generation is looking up to them going, Oof, I don't know that I want that. It looks horrible. They're more depressed than ever. They're more anxious than ever. There's things in their lives that are all messed up. I don't know if I want that. Every time that the world thinks that it's forgotten, 
about God and it's done better than God, God has shown up. I think that next generation that's coming up now, Generation Z, they're, they're going to be the, 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 the cross bearers. They're going to learn how to pray. They're going to learn how to focus. They're going to learn how to rely more on God because they're seeing what's coming and what's coming is not good. For us, it's going to be about renewal, about transformation, letting God move us to something different. And I pray that you're challenged today. I pray that going into this week, that, that you are going to let loose and eat all the pancakes and all the donuts and all the things you can on Tuesday. But then I pray that Wednesday finds you coming back to a place where you're willing to die to the world for 40 days. Die to the world, create new habits, Restore a relationship with God that can change the world. I pray that you're approaching this season with that transformation in mind. I pray that you are, you are moved today, that God's Holy Spirit is here and it's moving you to change your prayer life, to build it up, to make it more. Even if you even if you have a great prayer life now, I mean, I'm not saying if, even if you're spending an hour in you know, heartfelt prayer to God, make it too. And if you've got five minutes, make it ten. If you've got ten minutes, make it twenty. Do whatever it takes to, to, to dig deeper, to go farther, to pray more earnestly. Ask him tough questions. Push him, because he's going to prove it. He's going to push it back into you. It's okay. Christ is counting on us to make sure that the world sees him and that this world is not getting any better without him. How can our Lenten season be focused more on prayer and more on our personal transformation so that our lives don't look like the world and the world can see God for who he really is? That's our challenge. Are you ready? Amen. So if you would join